The gospel is the gospel of St. John, chapter 17, at verse 6 following. It's the high priestly prayer of Jesus. We're still walking from the Garden of Gethsemane, or walking from the upper room going to the Garden of Gethsemane. And after Jesus has spoken to the disciples about God, he's speaking to God now about the disciples. And this is his prayer. And from this prayer, you could get the pedigree of the Word of God. Do you want to know the Word of God is true? You can look at this passage here. You find out that the Word comes from the Father, goes to the Son, goes to the disciples by whom we have as uh, a gift from the Father to Jesus. The disciples receive the Word, They believe the Word, they trust the Word, they hold to the Word, they are sanctified by the Word, and now it's the disciples' job to go out and spread the Word. That is the pedigree of the Word of God according to John 17, 6 through 19. But that's not the sermon I want to preach today. That's just extra. You can find it there. You just read over it and you can see the pedigree of the Word of God right there. But instead, uh, I am a person that's captured by the church calendar. The cyclical nature of the calendar, we begin each year at Advent, preparing for the coming of Jesus. And then we go promptly to Bethlehem and, you know, on around to the cross and then to the empty tomb, and finally to the ascension. I'm captured by the church calendar. Thursday was one of the top five of the Christian calendar. And I was asking the kids about it Wednesday night. I told them I pulled out a $5 bill and said, "Uh, who can tell me what tomorrow is? And they guessed, and they guessed, and they guessed, and they guessed. And, and, and finally they said, give us a hint. And I should have never done this. It was my $5. I had earned that $5. I should have been allowed to keep that $5. But instead, I jumped. I'm not going to jump for you because I barely cleared ground Wednesday and I was feeling better then than I am now. But I jumped a little bit. And one of them, Abby, one of them said, when Jesus went to heaven... Now, technically, I could have ruled that incorrect because you're supposed to say ascension. If you don't have the right language, you know, it doesn't count. But anyway, she got the $5 and rubbed it in the noses of all the other kids. It was ascension day. Forty days after Jesus was raised from the dead, he ascended to be with the Father. And Scripture teaches us he's right now seated at the right hand of God making intercession for you and for me. For the first 40 days... He was popping in and out, doing the various things that he needed to do in order to leave. Now, next Sunday is another one of the top five, Pentecost, which simply means 50 days. But it was the early Jewish celebration of first fruits. It was a Thanksgiving holiday, but instead of thanking God for the crop, at the end of the harvest, they thanked God for the crop at the very beginning of the harvest. That first ripe tomato. You know how people are around here. They always want to rub their nose, your noses in their tomato. You know, that first tomato. And they promptly have to tell everybody in the county, I've got a ripe tomato. And the Jews would thank God. And that is the holiday that usually occurred about 50 days after Passover, which is also for us Christians, Easter, the resurrection. And the thing about Pentecost for the Christian is not so much first fruits. There's a joke there, and I'll explain it on another day. Build a little bit of anticipation. There's a joke about first fruits in Pentecost. Remind me next week. But for now, Pentecost for us is the giving of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus left Thursday, and the Holy Spirit's not coming until next Sunday. We're in 10 days of in-between time. Can I tell you, you can't shout, He is risen loud enough. 
to carry you through the absence of the Holy Spirit. We're in an in-between time, and there are times that you and I feel like we're in an in-between time. Have you ever felt like your prayer was hitting the ceiling and bouncing off in between time? Like maybe God didn't even know your name. Maybe you don't know God's name. You just look toward the heavens and say, Dear occupant, we want to hear the prayer of Jesus today especially for those of us who feel like we're in in-between time. Jesus has left us, and the Holy Spirit hadn't come yet, and so what do we do? We understand Jesus is praying for us. He's talking to the Father. I have made your name, he's talking to Daddy God, I have made God your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word Now, they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I've given to them, and they have received them. And know in truth that I come from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I'm asking on their behalf. I'm not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me. Because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Father, may the word of my mouth, the thought, the meditation, the heart of all here today be acceptable, or in the name of Jesus become acceptable. You alone are our strength, our Redeemer. Amen. He tells the Father, they received the Word, they acknowledge it's from you, and they have kept it. Of all the things that you could think Jesus would talk to Daddy God about, that would not be one of them. You might think, well, they'll run at the first sign of danger. You might say that uh, the one called Rock will deny me three times the first time he gets opportunity. You might say that those named the Sons of Thunder, James and John, the Boagonies brothers, y'all know the one? You know what Boagonies literally means? Sons of Thunder. You can see that on the back leather jacket as they run through town on the camel with racing stripes. Sons of Thunder. They're arguing who's going to sit on the left, who's going to sit on the right. You can hear the disciples Ask Jesus, why, why couldn't we do that miracle? And Jesus, very much tongue-in-cheek, said, Oh, didn't you know that kind only comes out by prayer and fasting? Have you prayed? Have you fasted? No, instead of saying that, what does he say about the disciples? Their gifts, God, from you. And they have received the word, they have believed the word, and they have kept the word. It's like, Father wrapped us up in the prettiest wrapping paper, placed us under the tree, and when Jesus unwrapped us, he said, just what I always wanted. We, in this prayer, are gifts from the Father to the Son. Jesus, earlier in John's Gospel, in chapter 6, will say, no one comes to me unless the Father draws them. That's why we Methodists believe so strongly in grace. Before you ever said yes to Jesus, God the Father was already at work, working in your life, drawing you to Jesus. Now, you should have said amen. It's too late. If I have to tell you, it doesn't count. But that's the essence of it. Daddy God is already working to draw you to himself And when he makes it, he gives you to Jesus. And Jesus says, oh, God, that's just what I wanted. No matter how you feel, we hear in Hebrew Scripture that the heart is deceptive above everything and desperately wicked. No matter how you feel about God, what Jesus says about you is you're a gift from the Father. And he receives you with joy and gratitude. But in case that's not enough, in his prayer life, he wants to give us certain gifts. Protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name. 
that you have given me. I guarded them. Not one of them was lost except the one destined to be lost so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. The first thing he gifts us in prayer is protection. Now, it's not protection from the devil. That's verse 15. That's not till gift number three. So who is he protecting us from in gift number one in our prayer that we receive during this high priestly prayer Jesus prays on our behalf? Well, the hint is, what's he praying for? That they may be one as we are one. Protecting us from us. I was taught by a professor at Emory University. Now, I don't know if this is good theology, but this is what I was taught. That the church is very much like Noah's Ark. If it wasn't for the storm on the outside, you probably couldn't stand the stench on the inside. I'm just, I'm just telling you. Sometimes we need to be protected from one another. I remember the time that I had back surgery. I thought I had held up very well, but when I came back the first Sunday in the pulpit and the lay leader was thanking God for Earl's successful recovery from back surgery, my wife pipes up and says, he's a whole lot easier to live with now. You know, sometimes we need protecting from one another, even if we think we're doing a good job. Bless God. Back in the 60s, the comic strip Pogo would give Pogoisms, and one comes to mind. I have met the enemy, and he is us. Jesus is being the buffer here between you and I. Suppose I come in someday, and I'm not feeling real good, and I do something or say something that's upsetting to you or troubling to you. Jesus is coming in in prayer life, buffering between us so that we can be uni unified and one. To what degree? To the degree the Father and the Son are unified. He's praying that they be one. Protect them that they be one. And to the degree that you and I, Father, are one. Protection is his first gift. He gives an additional gift. Verse 13. But now I am coming to you. And I speak these things in the world so that they may know my joy made complete in themselves. The second gift he gives is his joy. Joy is not giddiness or drunkenness. Joy is knowledge of the presence of God in your life and all that that brings. What I'm saying here is, while you're aware of the cross, your focus in life is more on the resurrection. Yes, your debts have been paid, your sin canceled, but you live a life in Christ. And the resurrection gives joy that you can face any trouble, any trial, and know that God is with you and you will be with God for all eternity. Too much of the time it may look like we're baptized in vinegar. And yet, baptized, I wanted to say water, but I'm going to say what the truth is, the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit, gives joy, gives life abundant. Number three, is the devil but here that the devil is only number three not number one can i teach you a little bit about the devil before i go back to my sermon we're told in first peter that he prowls around like a roaring lion seeking those whom he may consume you with me when do lions roar not when they're hungry when they're scared when they're hunting, when they're looking for food, they keep absolutely quiet because if they roared when they were hunting, when they were hungry, they would run the food off. They roar after they've been successful in the kill and hyenas come in to steal the carcass. And yet one lion with a lion's roar can run off an entire pack of hyenas. What does that say about First Peter? He prowls around like a silent lion? 
No, like a, a roaring lion. He's saying, oh, I'm so scared that you may be stolen from me by someone who just scares me to death. That's our Lord Jesus. Greater is he in you than he that's in the world. I have given them your word. The world has hated them because they do not belong to the world. Just as I do not belong to the world, I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I'm asking you to protect them from the evil one. In the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from deliver us from evil that's not a good translation you know what a better translation is Del deliver us from the evil one sometime in centuries gone by in the translations into english they dropped the idea that evil was personified it was a person but if you make an accurate, literal translation, it's deliver us from the evil one. Evil is not just accidental. Evil is a person seeking to eat your lunch. Do I believe there is a devil? What Earl believes is irrelevant. Jesus believes there's a devil. That is what is relevant in teaching. And yet, we're protected we're protected by the prayer of Jesus to the Father. We're protected by the word He spoke to us that we received, believed, and trusted. We're protected. Which means we can go out. He doesn't call us from the world. He doesn't call us to be scared and running. He doesn't call us to be safely in our little fort God. He calls us to be in the world, but in the world protected in the world able to do ministry because the devil can't touch us a last gift number four they do not belong to the world just as i do not belong to the world sanctify them in your truth sanctity sanctification sanctify them in your truth in the truth your word is truth as you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they also may be sanctified in truth. Two thoughts. Our sanctification is in Jesus. It's not in my ability. It's not in your ability. It's in his ability. But what does it mean to be sanctified? You've heard me say before, if you were awake at this point in the sermon, that back in a previous century, we would teach our young boys, don't drink, dance, or chew, don't go with girls that do. And we call that holiness. Sanctus, from which we get the word sanctification, means set apart. Set apart for exclusive purpose or use. Sanctified. What he's saying there is, I'm not interested in a hot date on Friday night. I want a bride that is pure and holy, set apart from my own use. My own dear bride, the first time we were in Florida at the beach, looked to me and said, if thine eye offend me, I will pluck it out. She was saying, set apart. Don't even read the menu you're not going to order. Holy. Holy pure the word of god setting us apart for the purposes of god so that we can live out day to day a life that proclaims the word of god that's his prayer that lets us know we're not alone we're not forsaken in the name of the father the son the holy spirit amen